So are you tired of every medical news story being about the flu? Let's talk about something different. Let's talk about stomach bugs. Because last weekend, as I was cleaning my son's barf out of the floor mats in the car, I thought, there is a community outbreak going around, and this is a timely topic. So let's talk about stomach bugs. So the symptoms that you can get with a stomach bug are variable, but they typically include some combination of feeling pretty bad, uh, potentially having some fevers, sometimes kind of high, nausea with varying amounts of vomiting, <clears throat> and then diarrhea. Now, if you've got horrendous vomiting and you can't keep anything down, then what I'm about to talk about won't be of much use to you because I want to talk a little bit about rehydration. So if you think I am dehydrated, then the response is to say, well, I need more hydro. I need more water. Well, from a rehydration standpoint, if you've got a lot of diarrhea, water's okay, but you're not just losing water, you're also losing electrolytes. Sodium and potassium and chloride and bicarbonate. Water's gonna replace the water, but it's not gonna replace the electrolytes. <clears throat> and so while water is good, water is imperfect. So then folks will often say, well, what about a sports drink? Because you know, these are formulated to have electrolytes, right? Well, kinda. So a lot of sports drinks will have a lot of sugar and some electrolytes, but they don't exactly match up what you're losing. So you're losing water, you're losing electrolytes. This will put back some of the water and this will put back some of the electrolytes, but not enough of the electrolytes and too much sugar. So sports drinks, okay, not great. What about ginger ale, often touted for settling your stomach? And indeed, the ginger can sometimes help. That can sometimes ease the nausea just a bit. But this is basically sugar water, tons of sugar, way more than what's appropriate for rehydration, and really no electrolytes to speak of. So this may be okay for settling your stomach, not very good as rehydration. So then, if you go to the pharmacy section, you can get rehydration drinks that are very well developed to match up with WHO uh, recommendations for different constituents. What's the problem? Ah, it's like drinking fruit-flavored sweat. This stuff tastes terrible. And this is four bucks. That's a lot of money. Now, it works pretty well, but it's not the most enjoyable thing, and it's not the best thing to pay for. So what's another strategy you can use? Well, here's what I'll often suggest to folks. Orange juice, this is a 16 ounce cup. <clears throat> so if you take about a third of it as orange juice, the rest of it as water, and then you add to it a little less than a quarter of a teaspoon of salt or baking soda, so it's not quite enough sodium to match the WHO criteria like this has, but it doesn't taste like you're drinking a sweaty orange. And it's a whole lot cheaper. All right, this part of the video is for the members of the practice. So in the members only video where you get additional uh, content and information, a couple things I thought I would share. So first, just sort of a fun little tidbit. So you, you've probably heard the name norovirus, N-O-R-O -O virus, norovirus. That's kind of the, the mac daddy of these viruses that cause a viral gastroenteritis. That's the one that you know gets on a cruise ship and like a third of the people on the ship get sick. The ship has to turn around and come back to port, kick everybody off, and they have to, to decontaminate the entire ship. Um, there's others that can do it. There's rotavirus and enteric adenoviruses and all these others. <clears throat> Honestly, you'll never know which one you're sick with. I mean, nobody's ever going to do the genetic study on your, your diarrhea to figure out what virus you have. But if we use the norovirus uh, family as kind of our, our archetype, uh, a little interesting historical tidbit. So it's called the norovirus. Virus. The name derives from an original outbreak back in, I think, the 1960s in Norwalk, Ohio. And originally, they knew it was something infectious, they didn't know what it was, uh, and it was referred to as the Norwalk agent. <clears throat> and then later, with electron microscopy, they figured out it was a virus, so then they called it the Norwalk virus. 
And then later it was, I guess, maybe they didn't want to make the people in Norwalk, Ohio feel bad. They, they changed the name of the virus to the norovirus. And that, that designation actually describes or, or uh, identifies a category of viruses. And within that category, there are several other very closely related viruses that many of them derive their name from the place where they cause the outbreak. So for example, there's one called Sapo virus, which is named for an outbreak in Sapporo, Japan. Uh, there's one, I, th I think it's named Desert Shield virus. Uh, apparently there was an outbreak, uh, I, I guess, among the troops in, in Iraq during Desert Shield. Um, <clears throat> but so th that's kind of the origin of the name of it. The, the, the original one is from Norwalk, Ohio. Very interesting. Okay, the, enough of the medical history. The other thing that I want to talk about is transmission. So again, using the norovirus group as kind of the archetype that we'll talk about, these viruses are ridiculously transmissible. They are so incredibly easy to pass from one person to another for a couple reasons. One, it takes very little of the virus to make you sick. You know, you only have to ingest like 20 of the viruses for you to come down with it. So that's tough. So you really have to make this, this uh, Herculean effort to keep the virus away from you. The second thing is the virus itself is very rugged. It will survive quite well on surfaces, on doorknobs, on countertops. It'll survive days, weeks, maybe months. <clears throat> and a lot of your usual things that you would use to decontaminate don't work very well. So three things I want to say regarding decontamination. So first off, hand gel. You know, this is the, the pump with the alcohol that you rub on your hands. This is pretty good for killing a bunch of bacteria. It's not very good for killing norovirus. So it's okay, but a lot of times norovirus won't die from this. So second, Hand soap. So this is one where soap and water is going to work a whole lot better because what you're doing is you are just mechanically removing the virus from your hands because if it's not on your hands, it's hard for it to get into you. So soap and water, better than alcohol gels. And the last thing is if you're trying to decontaminate the environment, <clears throat> a bleach-based cleanser generally is going to do better than some of the other types of cleansers that are available, like an alcohol-based cleanser. So if, <laughs> if it's going through the house, break out the bleach wipes, uh, and you'll probably make a lot more progress. And a lot of times that's what they have to do on the cruise ships is wipe the whole ship down with bleach. Doesn't have to be full strength, you can cut it with water, but, but bleach-based wipes are generally going to do a lot better at decontaminating surfaces to get rid of the virus and try to interrupt transmission. All right, I hope you found this interesting. Uh, it's an unfortunate topic, but it's good to have knowledge because in this case, knowledge really is power. <laughs>